Welcome everyone to the second lesson of this quarter's Teens Cornerstone Connections, which is presented to you by the teens from the Nairobi Seventh, Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. The people who are going to be involved in this presentation are, from my left, Joyce, who is in, who is in charge of sign language, Amy, who will be playing for us wonderful music, and our panelists, who include Silas, Misati, and Steve, and our wonderful teen teacher, Teacher Jonan. I hope you're all going to be blessed, and may your hearts be touched as we, as we study the Word of God together. Thank you.
God is good. All the time. All the time. And all the time. God, God is, is good. good. Welcome again to the Teens Corners and Connections lesson. This is the second lesson of the quarter, lesson two. That is greed, the bottomless pit. That is what we're going to be studying. But before we begin, I'd like uh, one of our panelists to pray with us, and then we'll know the names of our panelists. Let's pray. Our Father, who dwells above in heaven, we thank you this day for the time you've given us to do your word. As we learn, we pray that you may help us to understand and these things to stick in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Now, because you've already spoken, you can just tell us your name as we move towards the right. My name is Silas. Thank you, Silas. Uh, greetings. My name is Steve. Yes, Steve. And I am Misati. Misati. And my name is Jonan. And we're going to be guiding you th through this lesson. Now, it's an all men cast for today. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, as the song that just introduced us to this lesson, I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. Uh, today's lesson is just about worldly possessions and how they conflict with our love for God. Greed, the bottomless pit. Very interesting stuff. Now, before we get into the lesson, I'd just like to give a brief synopsis of what we're going to deal with. Now, in the previous lesson, we see that the Israelites have now entered the land of Canaan, right? And now, um, the Israelites are now in a place where they are conflicting the Canaanite tribes, okay? And one of them is the Moabites. And we're going to be reading about an animal that speaks. This is the only other animal that speaks in the Bible. We have two animals that speak in the Bible, the whole Bible. One of them is, Steve? Uh, the serpent. The serpent, yes. That's in Adam and Eve in Genesis. And the second one? The donkey. The donkey that we're going to study about today. <laughs> now, uh, before we start, the what do you think section. What do you think section. I'd like Silas to take us through that. The what do you think. If you have your lesson, you can just go ahead with us there. Uh, we'll go through the what do you think section. So the what do you think section says, desperate for money, a young man helps us. So even though his conscience told him it was wrong, before long he committed more and more crimes, and more he committed, the less it bothered him. The more wrong he did, the less wrong it seemed. He finally became completely immune to his guilt over the thievery. Why did the young man become immune to his guilt? Mm, mm, that's a very interesting question. At times we do the wrong thing so many times, it becomes the right thing to do. So what do you think made this young man who's robbing uh, a store, probably a, ba a bank in this case, what do you think made him immune to his guilt? Silas, can give us your thought. Okay, I think it's because he had done it so many times that it was something normal for him. So it never, it never bothered him that he did something wrong because it's now part of him. It's normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are some of the wrong things that, as young people, we might do that we've continued doing them, you know, they start to become like normal? What, what are some of the wrong things that you can think about, Steve? Mm -hmm. And then be starting. Um, I'll, illust I'll talk about probably bad habits, mm -hmm. like um, let's say we have an addiction to let's say alcohol. Mm -hmm. First time your conscience will really hit at you. Uh, you won't. You will feel really feel the impact mm -hmm. on it on your conscience. But as many people have found out, as time goes by, this causes it the effect to decrease on your conscience and the voice gets more silent, mm -hmm. more quiet, mm -hmm. until eventually you find that someone is immune to the addiction and is fully in it. So the, the voice that tells you that this is wrong no, basically this is wrong. stops talking. Yeah, basically stops talking. Mm -hmm. Just do it without yes. any remorse, without any, without looking back. All right, thank yeah. you, Steve. Yes, Mr. And I, I find one of the habits is something that Ellen White speaks of. And it's, it's one of the things that she's not very vague or ambiguous about, mm -hmm. but that she describes in great accuracy. And the particular thing she describes is 
flirtatiousness. Mm. That is, guys who find a girl, she looks nice, then he's like, hey, you? I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> so he decides mm-hmm. that he's going to woo this girl. Mm-hmm. But once he has wooed her, and then she, I mean, your box, so to speak, or mm-hmm. as in he has succeeded in wooing her, mm-hmm. he ditches her, then goes to the next one, and then repeats oh, the cycle. Yeah. That sort of flirtatiousness mm-hmm. is what Illinois describes. And I think that is something that we end up, that can even be christened or baptized be like i seem by it's just normal it's just normal it's like no. it's normal for women to say that men are dogs can i can i add can i add about the playboy being yeah. very highly regarded mm-hmm. uh they they talk about trees these days yeah 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 uh, they assign they attach various terms to it let's say the doctor of reasonomics if i may give an example so it's normally praised in the uh, modern day society. Right. Yeah. Actually, to speak on that, Ellen White, in her messages to young people, she calls it a sin. You know, it's called trifling with hearts. hearts. You're literally just juggling with people's hearts. That, that is very insensitive, you know. We'll see also, there's also a bit of insensitiveness that we're going to see today. But not to human beings, but to people, or to animals, I mean. All right. Now, uh, Silas, again, yes. before we continue, read for us the did you know section. Did you know section? Mm-hmm. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire persistent, persistently cherished, will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Every sinful indulgence strengthens the soul's aversion to God. All right. Yeah, so basically it just reminds us again, you know, the repeated doing of the wrong thing, it makes our soul, our hearts numb to the Holy Spirit telling us it is the wrong thing to do. Now, before we get into the story, we always have a fundamental belief in the lesson that aligns to what we're reading today. Now, today's fundamental belief is the nature of humanity, you know, how human beings are. This is the fourth, the seventh belief in the Seventh Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist fundamental beliefs. And it basically tells us that God made us, man, woman, in his own image, right? But as much as we are in the image of God, he gave us the choice, you know, the conscience. He gave us free will. God cannot force us to love him. God cannot force us to do the good thing. So he just lets us choose for ourselves. That's how gracious he is unto us. Now let's dive into a story today. And I'll ask uh, Misati to take us through that. So in this story, this story is a very curiously fascinating one first because we have a talking animal Mm -hmm. second it seems that god behaves in an enigmatic way but let me not jump ahead of myself so the story starts with balak receiving a vision from god god tells him because balak has pressured you so much Mm -hmm. do this i want you to go to him but do only that which i have told you to do so he saddles his donkey and he's on his way now an angel appears with a sword, but then now only the donkey can see the angel. The, the angel appears on the road, so the donkey swerves into a field. Balaam is like, why are you disobeying me? So he whacks the donkey and says, get back on the path. The donkey obliges. Mm-hmm. Second time, the angel appears where there is a wall to the left and there is a wall to the right. Now, so what does the donkey do? The donkey sees an angel with a sword, and of course, the donkey is frightened. The donkey doesn't want to die. So the donkey slams Balaam's foot onto the wall in order to be able to pass. It's like forcing issues. I just want to pass mm-hmm. aside. Then the angel, the third time, decides I'm going to place myself where the donkey can either go left right. or right. Mm-hmm. And it is at that point where Balaam is working the donkey and it moves. I'm not seeing anything. Mm -hmm. Now that's when the the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. And the donkey asks Balaam, have I ever disobeyed you all these years you have ridden me? Mm -hmm. And I think Balaam at that point, I wonder what was going in his head. This donkey, an animal, is talking to him. I mean, didn't he smell a rat? Like, I mean, something (laughs) is wrong here. Like, why is, how is an animal talking to me? And Balaam says, no. And then the donkey is like, why then are you doing this unto me? That just reminds me of what Solomon says, that a righteous man regards the life of his animal. True, Proverbs. That is, yeah. Proverbs. Mm-hmm. That is, so once 
Balaam's eyes are opened. Now he's like, oh. <laughs> now it just feels a bit sheepish. Like, oh, but I'm, I'm working this donkey. Now this donkey is saving my, my life. Mm-hmm. That is. And then the angel of the Lord tells Balaam that why were you doing this to your donkey? That is. And, and Balaam at that point just becomes sheepish and like he's apologizing for what he has done. Then he says, you know what? If this has displeased you, I shall not go. Then the angel of the Lord confirms the message and says that go, but speak only that which I will tell you to speak. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that very amazing summary. <clears throat> so uh, just to put it into, into context, um, Silas can be opening for us Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 9 before I finish what I'm speaking. So Balaam was one of the greatest prophets at that time. So the Israelites are just camped outside uh, the Moabites' place, okay? So the king, King Balak, when this guy's, the names almost sound the same. So Balak looked for Balaam and asked him to come and curse the Israelites. But Balaam really wanted the money. That's where the aspect of greed comes in. So he talked to God. He tried to convince God. You know, God, it's cash. It's, it's cash, but I like, I'll see what you wanted to say, but I need the money. Can I just go and speak? Right? So he even tells the king that, yes, I'll come, but I'll only speak what the Lord tells me to speak. But even as he's saying that, he's like, mm-hmm. I know God will not want me to cast the Israelites, so I might lose on the money, but let me just try. God might change his mind. And that's why you see the angel coming and blocking his path and all those other things. Silas, Habakkuk 2 verse 9, what does it tell us? It says, What to him who covets evil gain for his house? that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. Mm. Cursed is he. Cursed is he. I mean, at times, we tend to focus more on what we want than what God wants of us. Okay? It's something I call a pet sin. I like to call it a pet sin. It's something you just grow. You feed it. You take care of it you cover it from the wind and all those elements, you just let it grow. But in the end, it comes and destroys you. And Balaam's pet sin was covetousness. It's the covetousness and the greed for money that made his eyes even blind to see the angel standing in his path. Now, this this is a very interesting question we get in the Sabbath section of our lesson. Do you see yourself as being more like Balaam or more like the donkey when it comes to relating to God? Are you Balaam or are you the donkey when you're relating to God? Steve, what do you like? <laughs> uh, I believe in this aspect. Uh, when you're relating to God, sometimes we tend to lean towards Balaam's side mm-hmm. and uh, other times we tend to lean towards the donkey's side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Balaam, in this case, was not aware of, what, uh, of, God, of the presence of the angel mm-hmm. at that time. So he was busy punishing the donkey uh, beating it, telling it to go, not understanding that there is an angel on the road, you see. And sometimes we also, as Christians, we tend to do things not knowing that God is ultimately the one in the control. Mm-hmm. So we tend to do things, try to force things to go away, mm-hmm. and God does not want to maybe give us that opportunity at that time, yeah. but we try to force it. And as you've seen, the donkey didn't go. They don't really move. Mm-hmm. So we might find that we will be stagnant at that point and it won't lead us anywhere. True, yeah. true. And actually, speaking of that, um, reminds me that somewhere I read that when we try to contest to the Lord to do the wrong thing, He actually just allows us to go ahead with it and we get punished by it. That's actually in uh, Patrick's and Prophets, should be chapter 40. Right? Ellen White says that when we try to plead with God, when we try to begin with God to allow us to do the wrong thing, he lets us go ahead and we'll just reap our consequences in the end. And that's what happened with Balaam. Okay? Now, um, another question. All right? Let me just give a story before we get to that question. A story is told of a poor man who was walking through the forest one time. He was poor. He was very tired. And uh, he comes across a bag of money. It has gold, it has jewelry, it has bracelets, all those precious things. But in his heart, he knows this is not mine. So he does not pick it. 
and he just goes to the town that's close to the forest to look for an honest job to get food. But little did he know, some people were in the forest at the time he was seeing the bag, and they saw him not pick it up. And so he's, the, the good deed that he did, it spread out to the town. And the townspeople knew that this person is honest, and so they offered him a job really quickly, and he got some food to eat. Now, later on, it was discovered that that bag of money belonged to one of the richest men in that town. And the bag was returned to him. And the rich man was told, this poor man saw the money, but he did not take it. So in his heart, the rich man was supposed to reward this poor man for not taking his money. But he was, he was holding it back. But in the end, he just gave the, the poor man some of the gold, and uh, the people just praised him. He was like, ah, the rich man is a good person. The poor man is also a good person. But in all this, they both did the right thing, but for different reasons. Brings the question, at times, do we ever do the right thing, but with the wrong intention in mind? Like this rich man, right? Silas, can you just give us an example where you might do the right thing, but with the wrong intention or with the wrong mm, motive in your heart. Okay, you can say, perhaps you, get, you do something good because you want to gain, let me say, you want to gain the trust of someone. Mm -hmm. So you're always good because you want to gain their trust. Mm -hmm. So being manipulative. Yeah. All right. Uh-huh. Misati. Yeah, so I would see doing something good. The thing is, Satan is not opposed to good morals, that is. True. But now what he's opposed to is when things are done in the spirit of Christ. True. So one thing I would look at it is that you can do something good just because so that people have a nice, a high reputation of you. Like mm -hmm. the rich man. Yeah. He was like, let me just give him some of his gold because I want people to think I'm this good person, mm -hmm. I'm this altruistic person, you know. That is, I think at times, we are the good Samaritan in a bad way. And that is, someone decides to do something like helping a children's home or helping a street family or something of that sort, but then they're posting it on social media. Exactly. That is, I think that is uh -huh. doing the right thing, but with the wrong motive, because mm -hmm. it's a way of just getting praise that, hey, you're a good person, you do this, you do that, you do the other, but the motive isn't right. You want followers, you <clears> want <throat> likes, you want money, mm -hmm. you want to be paid by the streaming platform. True. That's the wrong True. motive. Mm -hmm. If yes, I may, if I may uh -huh. add, uh, it's, it's also normally very hard to distinguish people when it comes to that aspect as well, using, using the same example. Mm -hmm. Because one might do it to, let's say, spread awareness True. and maybe invite more people to, let's say, help the same, help the same people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But other people, you see, are uh, doing it for their own intentions. Mm -hmm. And that really brings, removes the good from out of it, True. which is a very disadvantageous thing that True. happens. True, true. And you know, we cannot hide our intentions from the Lord. Like in Balaam's case, he went, right? He went to, and he was going to speak what the Lord was going to tell him. But in his heart, he really wanted to cast the Israelites and get the money from King Balak. Actually, when you read uh, from the book of Numbers, chapter 22 and 23, Balaam was first offered a small amount of money by the king and riches. So he refused the first time. He said, I've spoken to God. God has told me, don't go. So the king thought this guy is, this, this is a type of bargaining. You see the way you buy things? Yeah, yeah, you're like, I ah, know this money is too much, you just go. So the king was like, probably Balaam is trying to lie to me. He wants more money. So the king, the second time, he sent <laughs> people with more money and more promises. And Balaam the same was like, mm, God, I really have to go. You have to let me go. And God <laughs> said, no, again. And now this second time, the people who had been sent the messengers, they just went back. And Balaam was like, that's money going. Man, I am broke. God, can't you see? I am broke. This is money going. And God was like, just go. Because God could see the intention in his heart. He was not pure. He did not want to go and speak what God was going to tell him. He wanted to speak and get the money. And God is not man. He cannot be lied to. And that's why he saw the intentions of Balaam. And that's how we see what happened in the end. Now, we can answer a few questions from the out of the story section. Misati, will you take us through that? Writing the out of the story, 
we are asked, why did the Moabites call to Balaam for help? Mm-hmm. So what do you think? Silas can help us with that. <laughs> okay, I think that Balak went to Balaam mm-hmm. because he couldn't find a way to destroy the Israelites mm-hmm. unless they are cursed. Mm-hmm. Sure. That's very simple. I mean, you, you can't be um, living in a place where you've seen all your neighbors are being destroyed by this enemy, and you just sit there and hope that your intentions are going to work against them. Yeah, makes mm-hmm. sense. Uh-huh. For another question? And the thing is, we now need to look at Balaam, the man. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the lesson paints him as this wicked sort of man who's devious in his heart. Mm-hmm. But so, what good attribute do you see in him? Mm. That is. Steve. Right, if I may talk about one especially, is that he's always willing to listen to God and he wouldn't want to go against God for other people or for the Moabites in this case. See, like he was telling them, I will come, but I will only say what the Lord wants me to say exactly. All right, all right. Well, one last question maybe? Now I would look at it and ask, what can we learn from this story on how God communicates with us. Mm. What can we learn? Who can give us your thought? <laughs> so for me, I, I, what I realize from this story on how God can communicate with us is that God will use anything and everything to communicate with us. We may not get to the point where you're going to have a goldfish talking to you. <laughs> we may not get to that point, but I see it that God can make things happen in a way until you're like, you know what? God, I think you're telling me something. Mm-hmm. Like things can happen and you're sure this cannot be a mistake or this, this cannot be something random without a reason. That is. And I think God can use all manner of ways. That is. But I think the thing is, if all else fails, these rocks will speak to you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I like that. I like yes. that. And uh, st- still on that, you know, the way the Lord speaks to us, you know, we can use the most unconventional means, like the donkey. But this is the most obvious way that the Lord speaks to us, the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, every single day, we read the Bible, right? Every single week, in church, in school, in some schools, right? Or when you're doing your devotion at home, you've, re- you've read the same stories ever since you were young, but they never get boring. You know, the Lord is constantly speaking to us. I mean, you can pick up this Bible right now, where you are, and trust me, you'll find something new you've never read before. Okay? Now, uh, we can read one verse as we move on. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. Proverbs 12, 10. Let me just get it. Proverbs 12, verse 10. The godly care for their animals, but the wicked are always cruel. That speaks a lot. Now, this is a very interesting aspect you might never have thought of. Do you know that the animals are suffering because of you and I? You might be wondering why or how. The Bible says that by one man, sin came into the world. Mm -hmm. That's through Adam. Now, when Adam died, the first thing that suffered, okay, first it was the plants, the leaves, because he cut the branches and made the the coverings for himself and his wife. Now, the second thing that suffered was the animal. Remember, God slaughtered a sheep, all right, and made coverings for Adam and Eve. And animals started suffering in that way. Now, Solomon, the wisest man, tells us that the godly people care for their animals. Now, this is something I've... When I read this story, I was just thinking about. uh, When the donkey spoke... Balaam spoke back. He did not even get shocked that this animal is talking. Right? It shows how much he was blinded by his covetousness, his greed. But he was a righteous man. But he let his sinful nature lead him into ungodliness, which is not taking care of animals. Now, how do you think, or what are the ways that you could help innocent animals that are being abused how can we help animals that are being abused yeah so i think before answering that question mm. i think something that just struck me in my head mm. i think 
I think Bala must have been extremely blinded because I'm imagining the guy seated on the donkey yeah. and the donkey is speaking to him. So the donkey is not facing forward. The donkey has Definitely. turned, he turned the head and looked at him straight in the Looking eye. Looking at him straight as in like, <laughs> have I ever done this to you before? I mean, and then I think he, he should just have sat there and just asked himself like, wait, this donkey has it's turned speaking. the head and its mouth is moving and I can see it. I think it's like, he must have been extremely blinded. Mm-hmm. And now looking at how we can help animals which are in need, I think one thing would be we can stop polluting rivers. I think that's something mm. that's quite simple. And that thing is we can stop polluting drains. That is when you, when you finish with a, a single-use plastic, I think we can just stop throwing it out of the window. So I think that's, that's a very... It's a very bad way to... Very, very bad habit. Yeah. That is. Because, of course, you know, that's going to go to the plants. Mm. That's, mm-hmm. And that's not right. You, know, you should not be throwing plastic at plants. If you throw it into the sea or into a lake... I think you'll end up killing plants True. or you'll kill animals True. because the animals can very easily get stuck mm-hmm. in those things or be stuck in wrappers and then they die. And I think yeah. that's, that's cruel. Yes. Yeah. All right. Steve, how can you help animals? Uh, okay. First of all, I'll say going to the bus that says that when, uh, when God was talking to Adam, he was telling him to take care of creation, you mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. And so by not taking care of animals in the first place, by treating them cruelly, we are going against what God told us to do initially. We are ready to obey God. Mm -hmm. And on the aspect of uh, uh, protecting animals, Mm -hmm. I believe we should... uh, uh, For me, I I strongly adhere to... I strongly praise those organizations that normally take in animals that have been cruelly treated and Mm -hmm. they give them a home, give them a shelter. Mm-hmm. And I believe that is one of the best things you can give an animal a home, a place where they can be reside. Taken care of. Yes. And mm-hmm. for those which cannot be managed at home, I best I believe it's best to keep their home safe for them. You see, something like you can go you can go into the topic of taking care of the plants, the mm-hmm. forests mm-hmm. and not not uh, interfering with their home. All right. Yeah. So basically, it calls for us as Christians to be advocates of taking care of the environment. Yes. All right. Silas, how can you take care of animals? Do you have, do you have a pet at home? No. no okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Perhaps when you go to the, when you go to the park or somewhere, mm-hmm. yeah, you can feed the animals or something. Right, true. To show, just to show that you care about animals. Okay, all right. And I also, this brings in another thought, which is a whole other topic in itself. Mm-hmm. The aspects, because it talks about, Proverbs 19.10 talks about cruelty to animals. Does cruelty extend to eating them? This is just a question I don't need an answer from you guys. Mm-hmm. It's just something you can think about. Does cruelty to animals extend to eating them? Because you have to kill it. Okay, um, it, it's something a friend of mine usually calls it. It's basically um, enjoying the suffering of other animals or other living creatures to please your taste buds. When he puts it in that way, it just makes you start thinking. So that's something I can leave you thinking about. Does cruelty to animals extend okay. to even eating I'd them? like to yeah. add a rhetoric on top. Yeah. So then I can now ask, so... Does cruelty to plants extend to eating them? <laughs> that right. is. So uh-huh. can we can we ask? Can we say that plants feel pain? That's mm-hmm. that's the question. It's, 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 do we know if they feel pain? It's just that they don't move, they don't mm. bark, so they don't bleed. So we're like, <laughs> maybe we are being cruel to plants <laughs> also. Well, that's just a side thought. Mm. But at least you know, with plants, God told us in Genesis, you know, we feel free to eat of any plant Fruit. that gives herbs and nuts and seeds. But animals came later after the flood. That's a whole other topic. Now, moving on back to a topic. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. You can read that for us, Steve. Matthew um, 6, verse 3. You can just read from my Bible here. Thank you. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. And it says, But when you give to someone in need, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Mm. That basically just speaks on generosity. As Misati told us before, the way people just give things for 
likes and uh, you know comments and stuff on, on Instagram and followers. Christ told us that when we give something to someone, we should not let what our right hand has done, the left hand should not know about it. Okay? That's also another lesson we can pick about it today. Now, uh, moving on, the further insight, I'd like Steve to read that for us, the further insight. Okay. So, the further insight states that it is a perilous thing to allow an unchristian trait to live in the heart. One cherished sin will, little by little, debase the character Debase the character, bring all its nobler powers into subjection to the evil desire. The removal of one safeguard from the conscience, the indulgence of one evil habit, one neglect of the high claims of duty, breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to come in and lead us astray. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from a sincere heart. True. Sure. And uh, what does that tell you, Steve? For me, I believe... It tells us to be very stringent. Mm -hmm. We want to allow into our hearts, into our conscience. We want to, we allow to go through our conscience because uh, when you allow something bad to go to our conscience, mm -hmm. it silences the moral the moral conscience in our in our minds. Sure. You see, and from the example we talked about earlier, when you start allowing it to go through the conscience constantly, mm -hmm. constantly without correcting it, it silences the conscience, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. And this can lead to very grave consequences, you see. And it might even lead to the denial of the Holy Spirit in itself, True. which is not a good thing in a Christian's life at all. And Man, I'd, uh, yes. I'd like to chip in, and something I realized here is God made us according to a certain set of laws. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, any law has its limitation, mm -hmm. so to speak, or any law would end up having its flaws. Mm -hmm. And I realized that in the way God made us, he made it that even, that is, he can call to us if we just have one seed of truth. Mm -hmm. God can use one aperture of light to draw us back to him. Mm -hmm. But then by placing that in our nature, it means that we can have one seed that can lead us astray. Sure. And I see that God, in his mercy, made it. But of course, now that means it can be manipulated True. by the devil. Mm -hmm. That someone can be righteous, mm -hmm. but by having one pet sin, that's what drags them away from God. In the same way, someone may be wicked, mm -hmm. but then by having one, one. tug at the heart, Mm -hmm. by God, they can be drawn to righteousness. True. True, true, true. And it's a good thing you've brought about the whole pet sin, right? Silas, can you just read for us the flashlight? It actually just portrays that concept in a very good way, the flashlight. Okay, the flashlight uh, comes from the book Bajaks and Prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, page 439. It says, Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. The sin of covetousness, which God declares to be idolatry, had made him a time server, and th through this one fault, Satan gained entire control of him. It was this that caused his ruin. The tempter is ever presenting worldly gain and honor to entice men from the service of God. He tells them it is their over covetousness that keeps them from prosperity. Thus, many are induced to venture out of the path of strict integrity. One wrong step makes the next easier, and they become more and more presumptuous. True. Um, Ellen White in Patricks and Prophets, chapter 40, thank you for that, Silas. She states that at times we blame the devil, right, for falling into temptations, but she says that even the greatest of temptations that we face is not a justification for us to commit sin. You might have faced the greatest temptation ever where you see there is no way out, but that is no justification for you to say, God, I fell into sin because I cannot handle this. God tells us, I have given you not a spirit of fear, but of confidence and of power. And Christ tells us again through Paul that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ellen White in Practice and Prophets, again, chapter 40, she tells us that when we are faced with the greatest of temptations, 
we should just pray to God and ask him to give us divine wisdom and strength to overcome it. Facing temptation is not a justification for sin. And that's what we're being told again in the flashlight. As you see, the devil, what he does, he's going to pick that one bad seed, as Ms. Satya said, that one bad seed in you, and he's going to help you grow it. Because he sees you're just keeping this pet inside you, and he knows this is going to be the source of your ruin, and that's what he's going to focus on. Balaam was covetous, and that's what the devil focused on. But we see the Lord is always gracious. God knew Balaam had all these bad things, but Balaam made some of the most profound blessings ever to the Israelite nation. You know, Ellen White says that when Balaam was uttering those blessings to the Israelites, he was shown all the way to the coming of Christ, how the Israelite nation is going to prosper, how there's no other nation that's going to be greater than the Israelite nation. Okay, we know they were spread out all over the world in the time back, but right now it's the spiritual Israelite nation. Those are the people who obey the laws of God. That's you and I, you, our viewer. Okay, so when we follow the laws of God, we share in these blessings that Balaam prophesied upon the Israelites. All right, any other comments before we come to a close? So, mm -hmm. mine was uh, one what you said about Ellen White about, mm -hmm. uh, about not being not justifying mm -hmm. uh, the various sins that we commit. And I'll bring us back to the analogy my friend here made of the aperture of light. Mm -hmm. In that the aperture of light, in the, in, it talks about like when you make one sin, mm -hmm. it can lead you away from the light of God. True. But also in the same sense, how one good action or uh, a calling from God mm -hmm. can lead you back into the aperture of light. True. And uh, I believe this can be a very good uh, way to look at our, to judge our actions mm -hmm. when you're about to commit to do an action or uh, do something you didn't want to do you mm -hmm. can ask yourself does this enable me to continue going straight into the aperture of light True. of God that God has offered for me mm -hmm. or uh, does it lead me away from God and lead to further darkness True. Yeah. True. All right. and one thing I end up realizing is a lot of times we rationalize sin mm -hmm. where we make it seem not be sinful mm -hmm. or we end up making excuses for the sin that oh this happened oh that happened now i mean that's why when, when we look at the model at times of of addiction or the way people are like mm -hmm. man really quite traumatized so as you know if someone's traumatized <laughs> they're like i was so traumatized my father used to shout at me used to beat me now that's why i smoke marijuana mm, yeah okay fine that happened yeah. but yeah. it's no longer happening True. Exactly. so you need not continue with that sort of mindset, mm -hmm. you can be able to break free because someone has a self-awareness. There's a True. difference between someone who is smoking marijuana because they know no better mm -hmm. and someone who has been enlightened, they can see this is what happened, mm -hmm. this is what's happening now, mm -hmm. this is how I can break it. True. That is, or, or for a girl who's like, I'm not whole because I was sexually abused, or sexually molested, mm -hmm. whatever, of course. The trauma can induce that, but Quite. when someone reaches the point where they are sexual, where they are aware, of what's that, happening. Yeah. Of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that this happened, and that this is no longer happening, mm -hmm. then they can be at that moment, that self-awareness is what God uses to enable them to live a more abundant life. True. Yeah. I like that. Very true. We should, at times we chain ourselves. Like in the previous lesson we learned, uh, the story about Houdini. He was trying to open a lock that was already unlocked. Exactly. At times we just put ourselves in these chains that are not really chains. We have the key to it. God has given us the key to these things that we are struggling with. Silas, to close, read for us from, uh, should be in the punchlines. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, as we close. Hebrews 13, verse 5. The very last verse in the punchlines. Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says, Let your conversations be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That is a very profound verse. You know, we should just be content with what we, ha we have. And as the song that we, we listened to before, I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide faith. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Finding God first will have everything else that we need. There is no need for us to covet. All right, that uh, brings us to the end of lesson two for today. And uh, we hope to join 
or see you in lesson three, where we'll be studying about roads to the soul. Before we finish, Steve, kindly pray with us. Okay, let's believe and pray. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, we thank you once again for a beautiful day. We thank you for enabling us to study your word and to understand your nature and to grow in you every day, dear Father. I pray to you that you may be with us, may we be able to internalize what you've learned and may we be able to apply the life concepts that you've given us in our own daily endeavors, oh dear Father. Be with us, forgive us of our sins that we may have committed, oh dear Father, and guide us all the way and let us lean on you, that was our Savior. For this is my humble prayer, we believe in trusting Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen, amen.